Welcome along to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. We are live. It's Monday night on the YouTube channel as ever. Welcome along if you're listening on audio as well later on on Catch Up. Joining me in the co-host seat tonight, making his second appearance of the season, Jay Moyer. Jay, delighted to have you back on the podcast. How are you doing? Delighted to be back, Glenn. Thanks very much for having us. I know you're itching always to come on the podcast, <laughs> unlike someone um, who seems to be. Well, I was gonna. It's not a good call match. I was gonna try and make a joke about nobody seeming to come uh, into the Aberdeen dugout, um, as of course the search for an Aberdeen manager continues. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have some news on that this week. Um, not saying we know anything. Um, just assuming that there might be a decision. Um, we'll we'll speak about that um, towards the end of the show, I think, Jay. Um, but of course, on this episode, we look back on yet another drab encounter in West Lothian as the Dons, for a second time this season, draw nil nil, and then we'll preview the visit of Dundee um, uh, this weekend, weather permitting. Well, actually, it's up at Audrey, so um, we shouldn't <laughs> have any problems with a pitch. Hopefully not. Just seeing how many fans I can upset in the opening 90 <laughs> seconds of this episode. Um, but Jay, you were down at Livingston uh, at the weekend. It was an unchanged 11 that started the game from our, our previous outing. Me and Phil on the previous episode kind of discussed about the possibility of Dante Polvara or, or Duke maybe getting minutes from the, the start uh, in this game. That wasn't the case. <laughs> Were you surprised um, to not see any changes? Happy to see uh, to see the same starting line lineup. I expected Pavara to come in, uh, so that was a surprise that he didn't. Um, I suppose you could argue it was a winning team, but the performance against Ross County was terrible. Uh, but then again, you know, as I say, winning team, so you don't want to change it. But I would have certainly put Pavara in. Um, so I thought he changed the game last week when he came on. Uh, so it was really surprised to see the same team, but you can also understand why he's done that, you know, because they won the last game. So, um, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I think he's trying to to show faith in, in the side that, obviously, as you said, <coughs> got that, that big result against uh, against Ross County and we're, we're looking to, to build on that. But mm. <sighs> Ewan's going to hate me because I'm not even three minutes into the podcast. I'm going to mention the pitch, but whether it's the pitch, the... <sighs> I don't know, like, I know a folk, few folk have maybe said it. Try to think of the the right wording. Desire, um, r- right now and kind of awareness. Yeah. About the fact that we're we're still potentially looking over our shoulders at, at this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't know what it is just now for for Aberdeen, but well, uh, I think Paul Donaldson makes a good point because, of course. Um, the weather wasn't exactly great, and we saw the Edinburgh City game um, yeah. abandoned not long in. But as I said, Jay, you were there. How how bad was the the weather conditions as well? And how much do you think they played a part? It was really weird because like one minute it'd be sunny, then it was raining, then it was windy. So you were getting all the elements really. Um, it was really strange, but it was it wasn't the best sort of elements to play football in. But I, I still think. Um, I can't use it as, as much as I would like to. I can't really see it as an excuse for Aberdeen. I mean, we were just absolutely terrible. Um, and I think the good thing about that was, um, as I remember to put my laptop charger on before it, it, it dies very quickly, um, that Levin came out and said that it applies to both teams. We can't use that yeah. as an excuse um, because it, it applies to both teams. And we didn't really cope with the conditions or I guess neither team really did because you know I was watching it at home and it was it was quite a tough watch yeah I mean it was just the basics of football just went out the window you know there was barely any all the sort of passes were good out of play experienced players like Hoylet that's played at a very high level just dribbling out of play just you know out of nowhere under no pressure really mm-hmm. um just yeah just nothing really happening in the game not even a lot of shots on, on goal no sort of keeper really having saves to make apart from uh, Miofsky being through one on one early on. Um, that was about it, really. Um, it was just, it was someone behind me said it had sort of a end of a season feel to it, and it was right enough. It sort of felt as if the, not that they were going through the motions, but they just couldn't have put two passes together. Um, yeah. And I was listening to the talk Livy preview, um, and, and you know, both you and Angus very much 
kind of of the feeling that it's a, it's another game closer to the end of the season, both not holding yeah. out much hope, and I'm sure um, those that maybe listen to, to their review will be surprised probably by how encouraged they were at the, the fact that they got a point because both were predicting a, a defeat yeah. going into the game. Um, but... Yeah, I think, you know, that Miofsky chance you you mentioned there in the first half was the only kind of real chance of note that I remember from the the first half, really, kind of from the whole game apart from the the end. You expect Miofsky to score that one, don't you? You do. Earlier in the season, I think he takes that. I think maybe he's gone through a bit of a spell without scoring. I know he he scored last week, and, you know, it was probably the most fortunate goal in the world, but they all count. Um, but, you know, early in the season, I think he puts that away. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just really alarming, the performance, you know, because if the players do care and they do want to stay, and the new manager or whoever's going to watch that, I mean, if I was the new manager watching that, I wouldn't keep any of them, to be honest I think, with you. I think um, it, it, what also frustrates me as well, and kind of going back to the previous episode as well, where you know phil was speaking about kind of continuing the the momentum and um trying to keep that winning feeling going ahead of the the semi-final coming up uh, in a couple of weeks you'd have mm. thought some of the players that um kind of underperformed let's call it on saturday you know john smith you know highlighting connor barron checking out months ago and leaving continuing to persist with him you'd have thought these sort of players would have been you know, looking to continue a, a high performance level to stake a claim for a match that it, it basically is what our season's got left to play for. Um, yeah. I, and I guess kind of on that flip point of what John's saying about the fact that leaving persists with him, maybe lulls a couple of players into that sense of security that, well, he's not going to drop me. You know, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter if I play good or bad, I'm still going to start the next week. So could... A start for Dante Povara or Duke, because again, I think John's highlighted, um, or certainly there's been a few folk have highlighted Junior Hoylet, um, in the the performance. Dropping them would that incentivize them to to raise their game if they were brought on as a substitute, um, and give Peter Levin some questions ahead of mm-hmm. of that Dundee game coming up at the weekend, and then going into the Celtic game. Um, I think the comment from Graham here about the, the pitch being too fast uh, after the rain and the wind making it unplayable, I think is, is very acceptable. Although I think the ball through for Miofsky from, I think it was Hoylet actually that, that played him through, yeah. um, was exceptional. But yeah, I was, I was pretty disappointed that, that, that Boyan couldn't find the back of the net. But yeah. probably just kind of summing up his recent run um, and our season really with a, a glaring opportunity missed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're speaking about the same things almost every week as, as fans. You know, it's um, it's difficult to know what the players think as well, you know, because they're probably thinking, like, I'm going to get a move in the summer. You know, my agent will get me a move. You, you know, you, you wonder, you know, long, long gone are the days where you kind of have to play well to get a move. You know, mm. agents know people, they've got connections, and you, you sometimes wonder, you know, are players really that bothered now? You know, um. I mean, you, I keep going back to it, but you watch us on Saturday. I mean, we somehow just managed to get worse. I mean, I, I don't know how we do it. Um, mm. I, it I think, though, for, for the game of the weekend, Graham actually makes a, a follow-up point as well, which um, I can't believe I forgot to put in the notes because I, I, I think we, we saw the Livingston physio on the pitch more um, yeah. than, than we did the ball in play. And I, I don't know, as I said, for, for me watching at home, it was frustrating. I'm sure for you as a, a match day going fan, yeah. that must have been extremely excruciating because it seemed that every 90 seconds of play we got, we oh. got about five minutes of stoppage. That yeah. first half in particular was so <laughs> stop start. Yeah. It, it created no momentum. You know, Graham Gibbs saying it, you know, commenting on the, the Livingston players breaking up the momentum with constant play acting. I think a couple of them were a bit more serious than, than play a- acting but yeah it was certainly the living physio earned their keep in yeah. that first 45 um i think in in total i think it was, it was well over 10 minutes of stoppage times yeah. across both halves um which which just sh- kind of shows how stop start that overall yeah. game was at the weekend yeah in the first half like you said it was just it got to the point i remember one occasion where I think it was when Yengi got kicked in the face or something. Mm. He went down, then literally got up. That was another five minutes. And then literally within 20 seconds, 
the other boy going down. He was back on for another five minutes, and it was just it was a carry on in the first half. Um, you know whether they were play acted, I don't know, but it was just it was really frustrating. Um, because I, as somebody said, you know, you couldn't get any momentum going. Uh, but even on momentum, like there was just no signs that they were going to create anything. I mean, they've got this awful style of play where I know, you know, Barron was poor, the midfield was poor, but, you know, I've, I've said it for weeks, the midfield have got nobody to hit. You know, there's nobody mm-hmm. making a run. There's nobody, you know, showing for the ball. They're getting the ball and we're so narrow that there's nobody to, to pass to. Your, your nearest pass is Devlin, who's, mm-hmm. you know, early behind. And then he's, you know, going up the wing, putting a ball in. And then nine times out of ten, there's nobody there. Um, it's just been the story of the season. I, I really don't know what it's supposed to be. Um, Clarkson plays this weird role for me. Yeah, I still um, don't really know what position he's been playing in yeah, all the season. I don't know what it's supposed to be. One minute he's at uh, left, but right back, and then he's, you know, in front of the defenders. Then he's, he's up, up top where he should be. And then he's out in the wing. I know he's sort of roaming about. I get that. But for me, I would just have him in the final third, you know, trying to unlock the defence with that the, the passes that we know he has in him. Um, but, yeah, it's just annoying. You know, you, you'll see Clarkson and he'll pick up the ball at left back or right back. And you're thinking, you know, what's he doing there for there? You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just weird. I don't really understand uh, what the style is. Yeah, and as Gary Farker says, you know, he was at the um, Spaghetti Hard first game of the season and we were rotten. Exact same performance at the weekend with zero improvements since then. Yeah. Um, Gary, that's a bit harsh because we actually managed a couple of shots on target this weekend <laughs> compared to the opening day of the season, so we've improved slightly. Yeah. Um, and as he said, that's the most worrying thing for him. Um, yeah. I, I think, though, that kind of what Gary says and what you've just said there, Jay, as well, is quite, quite similar um, and something I kind of brought up to Phil in the last episode as well about the the creativity that this team is severely lacking and at this stage of the season is it of huge significance when points given kind of us looking over the shoulder in that sense was more important Um, and I think again Saturday highlighted that it Mm -hmm. depends which way you look at it we've moved another point clear of Ross County after the weekend Mm -hmm. results Um, but Again, as you rightly say, that the lack of creativity and options when we're looking to move the ball forward for Boyan out in the yeah. wings is giving us lots of concern. And, you know, Kaiser saying the remaining games are a hard sell. Who's turning up for the bottom five mm-hmm. games? It's a fair point. Once safety is confirmed, um, what, what is the attraction of of attending those games yeah. um for me right now it would be a new manager and seeing what a new manager could bring um but mm-hmm. obviously th- that remains to see be seen <coughs> what happens on there yeah um peter leaving of course into the second half does try and change the game goes back to the same subs as he did from the, the ross county game with both dante Povara and duke coming on but Unlike unlike the previous week, there was no impact from either of them really. Um, yeah. Duke had that one kind of opening, but yeah. couldn't get the ball out of his feet. But it, it was just more of the same, just a little bit of fresh legs coming on. Yeah, I really don't know what the issue is, and you know me, I'm, I'm a big fan of Duke, but <laughs> he's you know all season he's he's um he's just looked lost, doesn't he? You know he gets the ball in the season before. You know, he would be away, you know, beating players, you know, full of confidence. And then this season, he's just not, he's not been at it, is he? I mean, he just, he looks like he's lost 10 yards apace. Uh, he just looks slow and, and lethargic. And I just don't know what it is with him. Um, yeah. And even when he comes on, you, you just don't believe that he's going to change the game anymore. You know? You, yeah. And, and you know, it's... Just, You've got the the chair and the vice chair of the Duke fan club on the podcast tonight, and yeah, it, you yeah. know, I think though you're right. I, whether it's teams have have worked him out or whether it's he's struggling to to get himself into the game, yeah, it's not that impact sub that we had in in October November when he first came into the into the team, mm. and I think as well, despite what the club told us at the the start of the season the options off the bench aren't what 
we no. need the strength and depth is, is is severely lacking um but you know thank god we only have six more league games till the, oh, the end I've, of the I've, season and it's finally, I've, never finally over. Season to, I've never wanted a season to end so fucking soon <laughs> yeah saying, it's just i i can't wait to the last game of the season the final whistle <laughs> oh, hopefully it's a Scottish Cup final and we've won <laughs> well, hopefully, I know. I know that's the thing. I, I remember when I put out the tweet about at the weekend saying it's it's one game closer to the end of the season. I was like, I've still got to remember we're we're a couple we're ninety minutes away from a Scottish Cup final, so it's not yeah. all dead in the water. But <laughs> it, it kind of feels like it, given that the level of performance at, at the weekend, Jay. You know, this podcast could be slightly different, and a lot of the the mentality of the Aberdeen support could be different. Had of course mm -hmm. the Boyan Miowski winner stood. Um, probably like a lot of our decent performances seasons, it would have um, papered over a lot of cracks had that mm -hmm. had that counted. Unfortunately, it, it, it didn't. As a, as we were kind of discussing before we came live on the, the episode tonight, it's another decision that took an age to to come to. Yeah, it, it, it's probably another inconsistent decision <laughs> yeah. um, that that VAR has. What was it like for you again being there and and the wait? Because as you said, you were singing the Miowski song, blissfully yeah. unaware that VAR <laughs> was in the background checking. Just weird, is it? Like, see nowadays, it's just you can't enjoy football anymore, can you? Because you're waiting for like VAR to just intervene and, and ruin it. Um, as I say, it was weird because it wasn't sudden. Um, we were, you know, everybody, well, it sounded like from, from where I was at the front that everybody were celebrating the goal singing and all of a sudden it was like, oh, wait a minute. And then it was like five minutes later, it was offside. So it's, it's, yeah, I mean, VAR, ever since it's come in, it's never been, it's never been sort of um, run well, has it? You know, there's always been, there's controversy every week. Um, folk said, you know, when it first came in, folk were saying, oh, it'll stop all the nonsense, but if anything, it's made it worse. <laughs> you know? it, it, it has, and and I think the biggest thing is, you know, normally for for offside, mm -hmm. that's supposed to be be factual, and you, you know, at the time I was watching on a a stream that that didn't afford me any any replay, so at the time, you know, I kind of just had to accept the decision. Now, for those that are they're watching the podcast live tonight, or or just in general here on YouTube, you'll you'll see that we've got the the still image that that's been doing the rounds from sports scene of the decision where Angus McDonald was the the player I believe to be a judge to be offside um, as part of this move, and they've they've hi highlighted Dan McKay um, from Livingston, who is the the Livingston player that allegedly um the, the the lines were drawn um mm. on um not that um as sam gordon says show us the lines you shite bags um because we haven't seen the lines um on sports scene which makes me think have they potentially drawn it on the wrong player because again for those watching the the episode tonight or have seen this still will know what i'm talking about angus mcdonald's highlighted yes but looking along the line you've got um Esther Stokler, I'm going to try to remember the, the number, uh, and then I believe in front of him is Miowski's definitely in front of him mm. and I'm trying to think who's sandwiched in between them, but you, you could argue you've got four Aberdeen players if you're we're including yeah. Angus McDonald in this all offside for me, Angus McDonald is, a, is kind of being unmarked, so for him, if he was offside, is offside <laughs> onside, <laughs> it's really difficult to tell, yeah. Um probably shouldn't be because you can see so far along the line the three in the middle you see it all the time at free kicks they line up offside and before the ball's played that the defenders fall back and, and play them all on side mm -hmm. but i think it's just it's scarcely believable that we've not been shown the lines over the course of this this weekend what why not uh, you know, and it, it does yeah. bring out the conspiracy theorist in you that <laughs> there has been a, a dodgy decision. And as Kaiser says, from the angle that we've got on screen, McDonald looks on side. So, you know, simply drawing the lines would clear all that up. You know, I've got no qualms that, that Esther, Boyan, and as I said, whoever is that um, squashed in between them, uh, you know, I think that's fair to say they're those three are offside. But 
the angle makes it makes it look on on side as well. And you know, and as I said to, to you and Rankin from the Talk Livy podcast, had there been on a grass pitch, it might have been easier to, to read from the, the lines on the, the grass as well. A plastic mm-hmm. pitch makes it a, a lot more difficult, but um look, we can't we can't blame the pitch for, for everything. Um but look, you know, you could go over each decision that, that's done us in um with with VAR, that's refereeing decision that that's gone against us. But you know, if we we forensically or, or deep dived into every decision, you'd sound like a Rangers da. Um, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, Jay, we are where we are, probably based on merit. You know, this team has <clears throat> significantly underperformed over the course of the season. We can't, you know, cry or blame VAR or bad refereeing for us being where we are in the league and us having. Well, certainly in the league, such a, a poor season. The players ultimately haven't performed. The, the managerial or coaching hopes haven't reached the expectations that the, the board had. And for the budget that they were given and the money that we've spent, we, we've significantly underachieved. Um, yeah. And I think underachieved is, is fair to say, even though you know we're in one semi-final, reached a final, that, that reaching that League Cup final meant fuck all given the level of performance that we were rewarded with in that, that, that yeah. final for me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it just it, it hurts on on that. But I just hope that for, for next season, because let's be honest, VAR is still going to be here next season, that there's an improvement to it in, in the sense that there's kind of a stricter kind of guideline. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a few people saying that, you know, if it takes that sort of length on time um, to, to overturn the on-field decision, the benefit of the doubt should be given to the decision on-field. Um, would there be any sort of changes you would like to see for a VAR other than binning it, of course? <laughs> well, I don't know. I just... I get why VAR is there, right? To get the correct decision, supposedly. But I just feel it just takes the fun out of going to football. You know, you're now waiting for people sitting in a, in a room or whatever to allow you to enjoy the game. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're mm-hmm. dictating. I mean, you could eventually, is it, I mean, what's the point of the referee? Because the referee doesn't really make a decision now, you know, it's, it's the yeah. people watching it on the screens. Um, it's just, it's just rubbish for me. I don't like it at all. Yeah. Um, you know, if you got a bad decision against you when there was no VAR, you know, everybody was hungry or whatever, but that was football, you know, and you, you went to the pub with your pals afterwards or, you know, speaking to your pals, that's what you had to, to moan about. You know, you all had a, a big discussion around the table. You were, you know, <laughs> shouting and swearing at each other and, and debating. That was part of it, going to the football. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, Sam Gordon backing <laughs> up what you say about VAR sucking the life out of the stadium genuinely makes him question why he bothers. Uh, and Graham Gibb, you know, is kind of, Going back to the point I said about what's the point in looking at each decision because as he's as far as won as as many points as we've lost over the course of the season as a spectator, it's rubbish. Mm. Go back to clear and obvious obvious stop re refereeing games, and it's that last point that I um, completely agree on because I feel certainly in Scottish football right now most of our games are not just sorry not just Aberdeen games but games in Scottish football in general are being re refereed. VAR is looking um, for reasons to disallow goals. They're looking yeah. for stuff through the finest of, of tooth combs and it doesn't need to be that way. Um, for those that maybe listen to, to various podcasts or watch various podcasts, um, Behind the Whistles is a, a podcast done by um, former referees um, of Scottish football. And um, if you want to catch up on their latest episode, about seven minutes, 20 into their most recent episode, they discuss um, what we've just been discussing in terms of the, the Angus McDonald um, uh, Miowski goal being disallowed at the weekend and why for the life of them, they can't understand that, that no lines were, were shown. And, you know, they're making life harder for themselves. <laughs> they're making life harder for referees by not doing something so simple as showing the lines or, re-refereeing it you know the you've made such a perfect point jay in the sense that controversial decisions were a part and partial of football they were a talking point post-match they were a talking Mm. point pre-match ahead of the next weekend 
your opinion, Jay, is totally different from my opinion and anybody listening and anybody watching it. But that also means the way you view an incident is different from me and from anybody else listening and watching. And this is also affecting football because the way one referee sees a penalty is different from the way another referee sees it. And I mean, you just need to take a look at Connor Goldson giving away a penalty in the Old Firm game yesterday. It was the exact same as what happened at Ibrox when we played them and that didn't get looked at. So swings and roundabouts are, are, are happening, but... Um, Sam Gordon says our game needs to be properly refereed in the first place before it can be re-refereed, which is a, yeah. a, a very valid um, valid point. But I mean, with VAR, it, it's almost like every week it's like they have to make a decision based on VAR. You know, it's almost like, oh, we need to look at this to make... Like, if you look, as a few pundits have said, if you look hard enough for something, you'll see it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's almost like they've got to have made it some form of decision every week. Um and it, it's just it's just getting a carry on. I mean even if even if it's like a even when you're waiting for a decision for the other team, you're waiting so long, you'd rather just like if the other team are getting a penalty, just give them a penalty. Yeah, just you know, get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. You just you'd have to wait ten minutes to look at the same replay four hundred times. Um one other point before we move on, because like I said, I don't want to spend too much time going over a subject that we could speak about forever and it's, <laughs> it's, it's not going to change. Paul Donaldson asking, should the club come out and make a statement about the lines not being shown during the VAR decision? Now, look, you know, interesting because I was going to make the point about and ask you the question, do you feel the club should be coming out and, and publicly commenting um, on that decision at the weekend. You know, there's other decisions that we could publicly have come out on mm-hmm. over the course of the season. I know that that certainly the, the one in the League Cup final where Duke got fouled in, in injury time, the club privately um, spoke to the SFA and asked kind of why that wasn't referred to, to VAR or the referee wasn't asked. Graham saying, please don't let the club come out with a statement, leave that to Ibrox. But we've seen it from, from Hibs, of course, in, in the game at Pataudry as well, where they've come out and raised concerns about um, VAR. Yeah. Stuart Kettlewell was very public in the, the media as well. Are, are you happy that the club are not going about their business publicly or would you rather they come, come out and spoke about some of the injustices that, that us as fans have felt this season? I would rather we went about it privately. I think if you start doing publicly, I think the SFA will just come down on you. Do you know what I mean? Um, and like you said earlier, okay, you've got to get the right decision, and we were kind of, you know, robbed if you want to use that word. But at the same time, we weren't good enough. Do you know what I mean? And okay, we've got the ball in the back of the net, fine. But you know, when don't leave it up to officials to to get you a result. Mm. Win the game. You know what I mean? We've got more than enough quality on that pitch to win games of football. Um, and I've never been one for, oh, referee was this, the referee was that. If, you know, you know what you need to do to win a game of football and we didn't do enough. I mean, uh, that save um, for the Livingston keeper, for the that was the only one he had to make the whole game. You know, um, we we're just not good enough. And, I don't want us to start, you know, playing the victim card. Okay, it was probably a dodgy decision, but just win the game. I know it's easy for us to say, but <laughs> we just we just don't do enough. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not a big fan of this blaming referees and and oh, we were robbed and all that. I hate all that. To be honest with you, um, I just want us to. I just want us to to play good football and win. <laughs> you know. Can't really argue with that, Jay. I think it's a, a perfect summary. Kaiser uh, agrees with you on that, and I'm yeah. sure that that many watching and listening will also agree with you. So, yeah, I, mean, I think there was um, many times. Sorry, there was many times on Saturday where you know we could have easily had a shot and a goal, and for whatever reason, it's another pass to the side, another cross in the box. You know, have a shot. How many times do you watch Celtic and Rangers have a shot deflection in? Do you know what I mean? You just never know unless you try your luck. And sometimes I just, I we're just we're so honestly. Didn't I get me started? <laughs> we're so uh, we're so annoyed. Like we're really annoyed to watch. Well, hopefully when Dundee come to town this weekend, we're not 
as annoying to watch. <laughs> so Dundee are the visitors to Pataudry this weekend. Jay, coming with manager of the month for March, Tony Doherty. Um, they do or are scheduled to play Rangers on Wednesday night at Dens Park, but with a yellow weather warning set to hit most of Scotland on Tuesday, that game mm-hmm. remains in doubt. And I wonder how the SFA look at scheduling the games, um, if that game is, uh, of course, um, not on. From an Aberdeen point of view, of course, looking at the league and for those looking up the league, of course, uh, it, it remains a dead rubber because with yeah. Hibs and Motherwell playing each other at, at the weekend, our top six hopes are dead and buried. For those looking over their shoulders, could argue that we still need to be looking at, at picking up points to uh, avoid that 11th place finish. Well, what's your opinion on, on the game this weekend? Does it does it feel a bit of a, a dead rubber this weekend? Because for me, it very much does. I mean, I think the only... Thing I was looking forward to was um, I know the guys from the, the Orkney Supporters Club are, are coming down for the game and was going to be catching up with them pre-match and right. um, I, I've certainly met a few folk from Shetland doing this and and in general and they can fair drink so it'll be interesting to see <laughs> if folk from Orkney can drink just as much as Shetland <laughs> um, For me it's felt like a dead rubber for months to be honest <laughs> um, just win the game. Just play play well and win the game. That's all you can ask. Um, I'd like to see Sockler getting a shot, a proper shot. Um, don't know what he's got to do to get a game. Um, and maybe even a few of the youngsters coming in. You know, you read about the the, the young team doing well. Um, there must be a few good wingers in that team that could come in. And, you know, now that we're sort of finished, are we really... Um, well, again, it, it wouldn't happen. But, you know, I'd like to maybe see a couple of them. Um, I just just win the game. I, I can't see us playing great football. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, we kind of just throw in the, the towel now. You know, we need to make sure that we're still getting results. But um, I, it, it's really difficult to, to get, be up for any game these days, um, especially now after the result of the weekend. Yeah, uh, as PGL Tuna says, or Jack McKenzie, as those that are regular watchers of this podcast will believe he is, says we still need to win one more game. This isn't done yet, although I think he's trying to throw me off the scent because um, there was a comment from PGL Tuna a bit further down that said that McKenzie needs drop. So um, maybe just try to throw us off the, the scent there. But yeah. I, I was going to pose you a question, Jay, and it, it kind of comes on to the, the back of what PGL Tuna is saying about we still need one more to win one more game. Pedros making the comment saying that every game is important until we are totally safe and building confidence for the semi-final. Now, with the semi-final in mind, you've just mentioned, of course, maybe giving Esther Sokler minutes. If you're Peter Levin, do you rest players going into this Dundee game with one eye on that semi-final and obviously the, the chance of reaching a, a Scottish Cup final? Or... Is that three points in the league still hugely significant uh, with safety still not mathematically secured? Do you know what? I'd be amazed if those players are needing a rest. <laughs> um, <laughs> they've not done much of the... Um, no, I, I'd go be our strongest team. Don't need a good side. Um, good young players. Uh, again, you're looking at every game this season and you're, we're not fav- we don't feel like favourites. No. Um, I just go be our strongest team because, you know, anything can happen in football. We start losing games and before you know it, there's a shock result somewhere and, you know, we're right back into the, the danger zone. So um, I, I wouldn't be resting players, but uh, we've not really got a lot of options, as you say, on the bench either. I mean, who comes in really? I mean, you know, Sockler, maybe like I'll say Sockler, Pavara, um, even Milne could get a but I would just like to see us play our, if that sounds funny, but strongest um, team and hopefully get a, a result. But I just on about building confidence and that for the semi, but I just like, I don't know, even if we were to win 3 0 at the semi, I just don't trust this team anymore. I've never actually had such a, I don't want to use the word hatred, but I just, I just despise this team. 
<laughs> I just I think, I think it's more I think it's more the, the frustration. I, I think yeah. hatred and despise is, is quite strong. Um but well, as you know, everyone's entitled their their own opinion. I think for me it's the frustration at how how much this team has underperformed mm-hmm. this season. Um you know, and it goes back to that argument that many people will have um or continue to have about how good this squad is um or how good this squad should be. Um, and what the reason behind the f- re- kind of reason behind our underachievement this se- this year has been, yeah. you know, going back to the point about you know kind of needing to win this game, um, a lot of people saying you know we need three points, we need six points. Kaiser pointing out that County are seven points behind us. For me, it's it's really eight with a goal difference. Um, and they host Rangers this this weekend, a team mm-hmm. they've um, yet to beat. I think it is in the in the Premiership. Um, so you know this weekend could prove to be a, a, kind of a huge in the sense that win that game and we're we're virtually um, you know kind of two wins really away from being being safe. But again, that d- d- depends on the way that the the post split fixtures work out. Um, it could be that you know our our first post split game is against County, and that's that that's what sorts out. Mm-hmm. So probably um, we are looking at, at six points to to be mathematically um, yeah. secure from the the, the playoffs. Uh, in my my opinion, um, just because I, I struggle to see where County are making up that that difference. I think yeah. you know me and Phil spoke about St Johnson on the last episode. That was a huge win for them against against Hibs. Um, some people panicking, thinking that dragged us back into it. But you know, the fact that we we got that point of the weekend to continue moving away from Ross County for me was just equally as important. I'm not panicking on the fact that yeah. St Johnson beat Hibs. They always have, they always perform well at Easter Road. So um, yeah, I'm not not panicking um, yet. Uh, anyway, I think you know Sam Gordon pointing out about Dundee being a tidy team. Um, I think they still show a lot of frailties, uh, unlike his uh, the person he probably learned off in, in Derek McInnes. Actually, no, maybe yeah. he probably did learn this because he hasn't <laughs> quite mastered shutting out games. No. Um, as he was prime example this weekend, as Dundee blew a 2-0 lead over Motherwell um, yeah. to succumb to a 3-2 defeat, yeah. which kind of has livened up this top six race between Dundee, Motherwell and, and Hibbs. So dependent on the game going ahead midweek or the, the result, Dundee could be coming north knowing they must take three points to, to guarantee um, a top six. A, a draw would be enough depending on results uh, elsewhere. Mm. Do you think that the significance of the pressure, I guess, being on Dundee for this game plays into our hands? <sighs> no, is my, is my immediate thought. Um, I just... When I watch Aberdeen just now, they seem to have a five-minute spell at the start where you think, oh, we're all right today. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, you can just see, as soon as the opposition gets an ounce of confidence, you can just see us going further and further into our shell. Um, and, and I don't know what causes that or if it's just a, a an accumulative thing with results over the season that have created this aura and this mentality of, you know, we can't, we're not up to this. I, I don't know. It's, it's um, as you said, it, it's not a hatred or a, a, a despise. It is more of a frustration. You know, I think we know that they're good players. Um, mm-hmm. The likes of Clarkson and, and McGrath. Um, you know, even Devlin, you know, we've seen it. They're good players. But for whatever reason, unless we get off that like a fly and start, the longer the game goes on, you can just see the confidence uh, drain out of them, and I and I don't know what causes that. Um, but I think the pressure will be on on us just as much as Dundee. I think Dundee will be up for it um, if they do need to win. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's obvious, but it really is a fifty fifty for me on Saturday. Um, I, I think the pressure is more on Dundee than it is us, given that what is riding on the game for them because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people within Scottish football would expect as I said if the game goes ahead midweek for them not to to take anything from yeah. that, that game at Dens Park which puts all the pressure on the game um, for them at Pataudry and 
I think as much pressure that will be on Dundee for me, I'm looking for, from an Aberdeen point of view, players to kind of step up and say, I want to be starting that game next week at Hamden, not into this kind of lull of, well, I'm guaranteed a start anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm. Although you do wonder as well, when it comes to maybe that nitty gritty 50-50 challenge, do a couple <laughs> of the players potentially pull out protecting themselves for mm. for the semi-final um coming up a, a week on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, and, and that that's why I would be personally would be tempted to to make a couple of changes. I mean, I would personally be happy with Esther Sokler starting, giving Boyan a, a wee rest, you know, bring him on mm-hmm. for the last half hour. Don't don't, you know, keep him in cold storage for the the whole game. Yeah. Um would again probably look looking in that that midfield for me Con- Connor Barron's the, the obvious selection uh, pretty much copying what Phil said last week at, at dropping for for Dante Polvara and yeah. um, could we see Angus McDonald coming back in for for one of Jensen and Gartenman and um, but again it goes back to my, the, the point about the strength and depth, we're only really looking at two or three areas where we could yeah. make changes. Otherwise, you're then going into a territory where the team probably does feel weaker. Um, but we are it's, where we are. Yeah, it's it, it really is difficult. I mean, I think, as you say, I mean, naturally players want to play in the big games. I get that. But, you know, when you're with players pulling out of challenges and like, I just think they've got a cheek to be protecting themselves when they've they've given they've given nothing all season, um, and I know naturally they they want to, as I just said, you know, be on the big stage and play the big games, and I, I almost guarantee you that they'll they'll, turn, they'll all turn up that day and put on a mm-hmm. good performance, and it'll be like a brand new team. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, as you say, you know, the, the depth. I mean, there's no one before you know in previous years where Aberdeen teams. You'd have quite a you know a, a good bench, um, and now for the last couple of years we've just seemed to to just it's like bare minimum. You know, remember we signed that um, strain. Oh, what was his name for Blackburn? The, the guy on loan, um, Mark Candy. Mark Candy, yeah. Like you know, we never really saw him. He was just I don't really know what he came in for. It was a mm-hmm. weird one. Uh, we've not really seen Phillips again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess looking ahead to the weekend as well, Graham Gibb asking if Ruby's back um, on Saturday. I've not heard anything. Um, I guess that'll be an interesting yeah. one to see from from Peter Levin's um, pre-match press conference because that would probably be the sort of game where you're looking to to bring him in yeah. if you know we're looking to utilise him in the semi-final because, again, for me, the type of injury that he's had, I, I don't really want him being thrown in at the, the, the deep end no. for, for that semi-final. But I guess those are the kind of the things that we can we can look out for over the course of the week, Jay, because right now it's guessing the, the starting eleven that's probably the most exciting thing between um between <laughs> games just now because as I yeah. said the games I really haven't lived up to the hype. But it's just a shame that that going into this weekend with the, the race for the top six is such that we're not there. It's we're we're taking part in the game but yeah. it means nothing to us. Um, we're gonna have a say I guess one way or another um on the on the outcome. It, it's just hugely frustrating. Um, that seemed to be the buzzword of this show, buzzword of the season, actually. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. Barry Robson, how many times I've probably used yeah, it on the right. podcast. Just, to say that. <laughs> Just to say that, it was his buzzword. Um, um, but hell, look, that, that's where we are. Um, let's just hope that there's a bit more kind of positivity and uplifting um, spirits that we can produce on the, the podcast next week, as of course we'll look back on events from Pataudry at the weekend and ahead to that, that trip to Hamden. Um, for the upcoming Scottish Cup semi-final. But Jay, thank you very much for your input over the, the course of the, the 45 minutes of the, the show tonight and um, for ably um, helping out on the podcast once again. No problem at all. Cheers very much, Glenn. Thank you. And thank you very much to all of you that have tuned in with us here live on YouTube tonight or cut caught up on video or audio remember to leave a like on the video, subscribe, leave a review, follow where you are listening. Thanks very much. Until next time.